Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, my daddy, the great one, so many names there are for you, Lord, but I call you Lord, Lord of my life. I'm so grateful, Lord, to have a place to go this morning to meet my family. Even when I can't come, Lord, that I can meet you with my family online, Lord, and, and what, what a blessing it is to me to, to be able to meet you um, in many ways. Lord, I, the greatest way for me to meet you is in my heart to have communion with you, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I ask that you would be here in a mighty way with us, Lord, that our offering of worship, Lord, and study of your word would be pleasing to you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone listening here or in any way that needs encouragement, that needs truth, that needs salvation, Lord, that they would find it this day, this moment. And just praise you for that offer of salvation and the assurance, Lord, that someday we will be with you and that we will never have to leave you ever again. Lord, I pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. This first song is one just about everybody knows and hopefully is one that you know from your personal experience. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's stand together as we sing. As we prepare our hearts for um, praise and song, I'd like to read for, for you from 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
exclamation point. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith, that's you, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not yet seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Praise God for his word. It encourages us and promises us many things. Let's say hello to our neighbors, wave and stand and get ready to sing praises to God.
Welcome to the house of the Lord, where we've come to worship the holy name of our Savior Jesus. I welcome you and greet you in his name. We've been slowly and gradually working our way into new and, and more of our ministries that we've been accustomed to over the years. Um, soon we'll be starting Sunday school. We'll begin probably with at least one adult class and um, some of the younger groups. So be paying attention for more details that uh, will be uh, soon to follow. Um, our, our holiday weekend kind of snuck up on us, and so we usually do not have evening services during our, our holiday weekend. So there'll be no church tonight. If you received an email about power and prayer, you can just ignore that, and we'll, we'll pick that up again uh, next week. Um, we do have plans to start Awana in October, and so there's some information in your bulletins about that and some things that we're doing to make that um, as safe as possible for our kids and appreciate your cooperation in that. And do welcome children that we might have here this morning and those that might be Zooming with us or those that might be watching us on the podcast later. And so for you, we have our children's time with Mr. Terry right now. Hey, good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to children's time. For all those who are here this morning, good morning. Hey, to you. Hey, to David up in, up in the balcony up there. Um, hey, to any other kids that are up there. Uh, those, those of you who are not able to come this morning, it's time to gather around your television, your, your computers, your tablets, or your phones, so we can hang out for a short bit today virtually. So today is Promotion Sunday. Promotion Sunday is the day when you move up. When you come out in Sunday school, we're no longer in preschool, we're moving up to kindergarten, if we're in, in elementary grade, we're moving up to junior high school, um, and so on. So you, you, the church has a special place for you in Sunday school and we want you to move up in the grade just like you do at school. Hmm. Speaking of school, it's time to go back to school. Some of you have already started school, but many of you will be starting soon. And going back to school, oh, there's lots of things to be concerned about. You know, that are you going to like your teachers? Is your teacher going to like you? Um, can, I, can I buy something over here? So I can like, okay, so um, will your teacher like you? Will you like your teacher? You know, there's all kinds of things. You have the masks that we have to wear, some of us are the gloves. You know, we've got all kinds of things that are different this year to normal. Some of you are going to school on your computers at home. And you are going to be really there for you to have to do it on your screens. On your tablet, on your computer, that's okay. One of the things that I want you to realize is, is that God will be with you wherever you're going to school. Okay? And, and let me go a little bit of scripture in here. In Proverbs chapter 1, it talks about the wise are always thinking and listening and learning. That's 
that we should do our best for Jesus. And let me see. You're going to school. You're going to school virtually, you need to home. That doesn't mean you can sleep all day and get away with it. That doesn't want that, that's not what that means. You, God doesn't want you to do your best thinking. He wants you to do your best work to learn. So your parents, they have a job. They go to work and they get a paycheck. If you go to school, that's your job. Your job as a student is to go to school and learn. Like it says in Proverbs, be wise. Don't you become wise? You can only become wise if you learn. So, one of my students once said to me, Mr. Perry, that doesn't make sense. But I go to school and I don't get paid. Now, my parents go to work and they get paid, but I don't get paid. So, when you do get paid, no, I don't get paid. Yes, you do. Your payment is knowledge. So that when you get older, you'll have the knowledge to be able to get a job. And then you get a paycheck that's actually when you get paid money. And if you're being wise and you're following what it says in Proverbs, then you're going to be doing your best to go to school and to learn, not learn to patients, not snoozing on your desk, and not only enjoying my favorite first school lunch, <laughs> but just enjoying lunch, but enjoy, try to learn, try to get as much as you can from your teachers. God wants us to do that. In the back to school season, whatever it is, whether it's at school with your friends, whether it's virtually on the computer, or for some of you go like, eh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, it's Tuesday, Thursday, the next week, and you will all be confused. And I mean, some of us will get on the wrong bus, and we might even go to the wrong school. But that's okay. Whatever school we end up at, we have to concentrate on learning, being wise, and listening, and becoming better at what we do than doing our best for Jesus. If our behavior is good at school, then we might live off with some of the kids at school that this behavior is not so good. But most importantly, remember, going back to school is our job. That's what we got to do. And let's do it to the best of our abilities. When we come to the Sunday school, when we come to Obama, when we come to church on Sunday, that's to learn and become wiser and smarter in, in gaining the tools that we need. So I've got my backpack here, and I've got my hat on, and I've got my, my, my headset, my mask, and my, and my uh, hand sanitizers, and my waist pad. I think I'm ready to go. I also got to lunch. Better go back home and get the lunch. But that's okay. If you guys are ready, let's, let's all be ready. Let's pray for you now. Congregation, I need you to help us. Let's pray for our, all of our students that are going back to school this year. So bow your heads, close your eyes, hold those paws, and let's begin to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for each one of and every one of the boys and girls that are here today. And Lord, we as a congregation pray for all of our students that you will guide them, that you will help them to become wiser and stronger people, and that they can do their best for you so that they can do the best for your kingdom and can be very smart and wise in this world. So with us now, help with those backpacks that we have to safely carry all of our stuff, even though our backpack weighs more than we do. Help us, help us to get through school with those, help us to learn our teachers, and help us to do the things that we need to do to drive safely on the bus, and on the cars, or however we get to school. And Lord, if we're using technology, it's up the technology to work right. And we pray for the teachers and our administrators, our gym teachers, the lunch people, everybody. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, to Mr. Terry, for that perfect augment to my Labor Day sermon. As we go to prayer, I want to... Uh, us to thank God for people like Mr. Terry and others who are not able to return to church physically but are still impacting our church in so many ways. And for those that are Zooming with us or joining us later, we just appreciate your continued participation and, and your impact on our church. And we look forward to that day that we can all be together. I do have a few sad things to report. A number of people that we've been uh, praying for, uh, Bruce Tuttle and Nancy Arbuckle, both passed away this past week. Uh, they are kind of outside connected to our church, uh, 
friends of the Beatys and relatives of the Beatys. And so continue to, to pray for those families and to pray for Shirley as she continues her recovery from open heart surgery. Speaking of recoveries from open heart surgeries, Michelle Bonner is back with us today and we just praise and thank God for that. <laughs> and let's continue to, to pray for those that have been on our list. And again, if you have other people that you would like to include on our list, uh, Mary Payton is new to that too. Mary had uh, a foot surgery this week and it sounds quite painful for her. So I'll be praying for Mary's recovery as she gets over that. And let's pray for all the rest on our list and uh, all other things that you might have in your minds and hearts today as you pray silently, and then I'll close our prayer. Lord, how we thank and praise you for your presence in our midst, that you are with us wherever we are, wherever we go, but in this special place, in this special time, we just thank you for allowing us to experience your presence in a powerful and fresh way. So speak to our hearts today as we talk to you, help us and teach us to listen to you. Thank you for so many answered prayers and for healing and help that you provided for those that have been in dire distress. And for those answers to our prayers that may be unlike what we prayed for, but still we trust as your answers. We pray for those that are grieving losses this week, for the Tuttle and the Arbuckle families in the heartbreak of, of the loss of loved ones. We pray that you would just be near to each person in those families, bring comfort and a sense of your presence and your peace. We pray for others that have been going through difficult times as we have our list of people that have gone through surgeries or dealing with illnesses and recovering from, from grief and are in the midst of illness right now. We pray that you'd be with each one and bring healing and help and hope. And may each of these experiences teach us to trust you in a deeper and more fuller way. Forgive us of our sins for our lack of faith, our lack of trust when life is overwhelming, and teach us to find grace and truth in your word and power through our faith in the name of Jesus. Help us to trust you and to walk in obedience to your commandments, and help us to walk in that holiness that we have because of the forgiveness of our sins and the righteousness that you provide for us. Help us to be your church wherever we are, not just in this building, but in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in the schools, in our workplaces. And Lord, I pray that you would bless each gift that has been brought today and bless each giver. And may you take every penny that has been brought to you in your name and multiply it to do mighty things so that Jesus might be known, experienced, and proclaimed through our ministry and through our lives. For all these things we ask in Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's stand once again and sing a chorus that we've grown to love, Lamb of God.
This is a, a song that I wrote myself about five or six years ago, and I think I sang it for you then, but it just seems to be more of a, of a timely thing today, so I'd like to, to share it again. And it's got a lot of words, so I had the words put up on the screen that might help you to follow the train of thought. I've been struggling to understand the present state of fallen man and I just can't imagine where we'll go from here as I'm pondering the mystery how we've abandoned history and listen to those words that tickle itching ears we have tried to define truth in the light of circumstance and we've compromised the word of God under the guise of tolerance. But there remain some things that we can know to be as true. And these truths aren't relative, they're absolute. God is one and he is real. his son to cleanse and heal whether you're near or far now we can't hope to recompense our full descent to decadence and there's no sin that we don't try to justify now our current generation needs a solid proclamation of the saving grace of Jesus Christ the crucified. We have forfeited God's standards for morality, and we've sacrificed the virtues of our new identity. But there remain these things that we can know without a doubt. And they're really not that hard to figure out. Jesus died because we sinned, but that's how much he loves. Now glorified cause he rose again, but that's just what he does. Now when considering solutions, there just is no resolution to this problem that has plagued us from the very start. But to become a believer, God defeated the deceiver when he made a way to give to you a brand new heart. There's no way to overestimate the gravity of the consequences of our own depraved humanity. And so we cling to truths that we can know are from God's Word, even though the world says that they are absurd. Christ is King who reigns on high, the Savior for all men, and everything is drawing nigh for Him to come again. He knows who you are, whether you're near or far. That's how much He loves. That's just what he does. Oh yeah, now that's just what he does. Ecclesiastes 3, verses 12 through 14. I know that there's nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That is, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, 
and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Recently, I stopped at a red light and saw a bumper sticker on the car in front of me that said, I'm in no hurry, I'm on my way to work. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? Surveys indicate that this is how most Americans feel about their job. Experts say that seven out of 10 Americans are dissatisfied with their job and they dread going to work. Someone once asked a man, how long does it take you to get to work in the morning? And he said, well, usually I get to work about a half hour after I clock in. <laughs> this is the attitude that a lot of people have about work. And it's unfortunate since the, in the course of our lifetime, most people spend about 40% of their lives on the job. And it seems crazy to invest so much of your life doing something that you don't enjoy. But many people just feel trapped in their jobs and they don't see any way out of it. This is Labor Day weekend, and so we're going to look at what the Bible says about your job and about your career. Whether you love your job or you hate it, the Bible has a great deal to say about how your attitude can improve your work life. Former Dallas Cowboy coach Tom Landry knew how to get the most out of his players, and he made this statement. When people aren't happy doing what they do, they don't do it as well as when they're happy. Very simple, obvious statement, but quite profound when you think about it. It's not that being happy is the sole criteria for what job you should have, because happiness is a fleeting thing at best. But the point is, it's hard to excel in a job that you hate doing. And it's hard to love a job in which you do not excel. So there has to be a starting point somewhere. And that starting place is with God. It's your relationship with God that can bring excellence into the workplace, whatever it might be, whether it's in a factory or out in the field or in school building or in an office or in a hospital or in a church or whether you're in the home or whether if you're retired you still have a job you have work to do you have to manage your household you have family to take care of you have volunteer work you're doing in the church you, you, everyone does have a job to do and have you noticed when you're excelling at work it's easier to enjoy all the other areas of your life too have you ever been to a party or a family gathering, or maybe even on vacation, and you were just unable to enjoy it because you couldn't leave behind the worries and the stress of your job? Now, that's happened to everyone at one time or another, and it will happen in any job. However, there are some times that we need to just assess where we are going in our careers and just confirm that we're on the right track. So today we're going to look at four questions that you can ask yourself about your job. If you can answer yes to all four, then I'd say you're on the right track. If not, then you might want to rethink some things about this extremely important area of your life. Solomon said in our verse 12 of our passage today that Simon read for us, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. So here are four questions that you can ask yourself about your job. First one is, does this job provide enough to meet my needs? As long as your answer to this question is yes, then salary should never be the primary factor in considering your job. Obviously, you have to earn enough to meet your obligations, to support your family, put food on the table, a roof over your head, you know, pay your bills, and so forth. But beyond that, if you choose a career or a particular job based on the salary package, you are quite possibly just setting yourself up for misery. Maybe you've had the situation come up in your life when you were picking between two jobs and one paid more than the other. And for some, that's just a no brainer. You know, if one job pays more than another, then of course you should take that job. That's why we work, isn't it? To earn a living. So if one job pays more than another job, it's a better job, right? Well, you could be making a huge mistake by having that attitude. The financial considerations are only a minor part of the whole decision-making process regarding your work. When it comes to finances, there's only one real question that matters. Does this job pay enough to enable me to meet my obligations? Solomon said that it is the gift of God if a person's work provides him or her with enough to eat and drink, or in other words, to meet their physical needs. And so if it does, then it passes the test. This, this is just a minor point compared to the other ones I want to make this morning, but this is a step that many people never get past. 
It's understandable how a non-Christian could be obsessed with money or the lack thereof. You know, the world gauges success based on your salary or your bank account or your possessions. But so many Christians also get caught up in the mindset that this first point might be totally lost on them too. Some people would feel that they're not making enough to meet their obligations no matter how much that they make. And that has to do with the way that you use your income, the way that you spend your money and how you feel about money that reveals a great deal about your whole spiritual life. Christians who tithe their income are the ones who usually feel that they have enough to meet their needs, no matter how much they make. Christians who don't tithe are the ones who usually feel that they don't have enough, no matter how much they make. That's why they don't tithe, because they don't feel they have enough. I, I can't pay my bills and tithe too. But tithing has nothing to do with how much you make. It has to do with trusting God enough to obey him and to return to him that first 10% of what you make, no matter how much that is. And so this first point about assessing your job is built on the assumption that you're not robbing God and you are trusting him to, uh, to provide for your needs. And at that point is when you ask yourself if your job provides enough to meet those needs. And if it doesn't, then you need to seek the Lord's guidance for a job that would. Now, this is an initial consideration but not nearly as important as others that you need to make. The, the next questions that I'm going to have you ask yourself are much more important. Secondly, you need to ask yourself, does this job give me the opportunity to do good? Solomon also said in verse 12, I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. Does your job make it possible for you to do good for others? If you're working in a job that would require you to oppress people or to behave dishonestly or to take advantage of others, and there are jobs like that, well, then you need to change jobs or you need to change the way you do your job. Your job must provide a means for you to do good for others. And there are a number of ways that that can happen. Now, some people have jobs that are service-oriented. By simply doing their jobs, they are directly benefiting others. Other people have jobs that are not necessarily service oriented, but the job might make it possible for them to give financially or to participate in other kinds of ministries. Just because you work in a factory or behind a desk in an office, that doesn't mean that you don't have opportunities to do good. Actually, some people are more able to do good in those positions than people in service oriented positions are because they might be more naturally adept at sharing their faith or reaching out to people just in the context of their everyday work life. I've known factory workers and office workers who have started lunch hour Bible studies or who have made more of an impact on their co-workers than people who are in professional ministry. And the fact remains that if you are in a job that you have contact with other people, you do have the opportunity to do good. But for those who feel they don't have much contact with people and their jobs don't really allow them to help anybody, there's always the possibility that God has provided the income that you make from your job to be the means by which you can do good for others. Or perhaps your work schedule permits you to give some extra time in helping others or serving the Lord in, in various capacities. And so when I ask you, does your job give you opportunities to do good, there's a broad range of possibilities in your answer to that question. But still, it's an important question to ask. Maybe Changing the world just isn't built into your job description, but you can use that job to give you leverage to minister in other areas. A biblical example of this is the Apostle Paul. His calling was to be an apostle, and he spent most of his life evangelizing and discipling and planting churches. But periodically, his vocation was to be a tent maker. He made tents in order to, to finance his ministry read of an attorney named Ivy Scarborough who does this too. He loves practicing law and he's quite good at it, but he sees his law practice as a, a means to support his ministry. Because of the income that he makes from being a lawyer, he's able to take mission trips to Sudan and Afghanistan and other war-torn countries. So make sure that your job gives you the chance to do good. Even if your job might seem to be mundane sometimes, you still have the opportunity to minister to those that you work with and just to offer them encouragement or to be an example of Christ to them. And so ask yourself, does my job give me the opportunity to do good? How can I use it to help others? Does it mean that I might be able to have more to give to God's work? Or will it give me more time to volunteer 
for God's ministries? Does it give me the chance to minister to people that I work with on a daily basis? Then the third question is also important. It is, does this job give me a sense of fulfillment? Solomon said in verse 13, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. If you don't receive satisfaction from doing your job, a sense that you are fulfilling a sense of purpose, then maybe the job that you're doing now is not all that God has in mind for you to be doing with your life. Now, of course, every job has certain aspects to it that make it difficult, parts of it that we don't like. Every job, you know, part of your job may be very tedious or it might be very frustrating at times. It could be very stressful. It might be very demanding. I feel like it's too demanding sometimes. It might even be boring sometimes. In fact, if you don't have difficult aspects to your job, then I doubt very much that it can be fulfilling for you. For it's often in dealing with the hard parts of the job. And there are a lot of hard parts to every job, but those hard things that you have to deal with. Problem solving, you know, overcoming obstacles, you know, getting used to accomplishing things even though you have to work with people that are hard to get along with. You know, doing something that you hadn't been able to do before. You know, these are the things that actually bring the greatest satisfaction. An easy job probably isn't the best job. Sometimes, I know we all wish our jobs could be easier, but that may not be what we really want. In 1982, two Soviet cosmonauts touched down after 211 days in space. They suffered from dizziness and high pulse rates and heart palpitations. They couldn't walk for a week, and after 30 days, they were still undergoing therapy for weakened muscles and hearts. See, at zero gravity, the muscles of the body begin to waste away because there's no resistance. And the Soviets had not taken that fact under consideration. And so to counteract that, they prescribed a vigorous exercise program for their cosmonauts while they were in space. And they also invented what they call the penguin suit. The penguin suit was a, a running suit that was laced with elastic bands. And it would resist every movement that the cosmonauts made, forcing them to exert their strength even in zero gravity. In 1987, a Soviet returned to Earth after 326 days in orbit and he was in excellent health because of that penguin suit. See, work is good for us. We were created to work. Work brings fulfillment. The curse upon Adam was not that he had to work, as some people say, but uh, rather that the ground upon which he worked was cursed. It produced thorns and, and thistles, which inhibited his work and made it hard, made it hard to produce. But to, to still be able to produce a crop despite the problems of the land and the sweat of the brow, that was a source of great fulfillment. You know, easier is not necessarily better. In fact, the more difficult the task, the greater the sense of fulfillment and accomplishment. And so the question is, overall, does the job that you're doing give you a sense that you're doing what God created you to do? Are you able to feel the satisfaction of a job well done and of something tangible being accomplished? God wants you to find fulfillment in your work. That is his gift to you. Work isn't a punishment. It is a blessing. And your job can be much more than just 40 hours of misery that you have to endure so they can pay your bills. But it can give you a sense of fulfillment and purpose. Marcia Sinatar has written a book titled, Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow. That's a great concept. Find a job that you love and don't worry about the income as long as your income is enough to provide for your basic needs. Now, money is not the most important aspect of your career. It is far more rewarding to spend your life doing something that you love, something that you find fulfilling, something that enables you to do good for others, and something that enables you to bring glory to God. If you do that, the money takes care of itself. Proverbs 22, 29 says, Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. God will take whatever it is you're skilled at and use it for his glory when you give it to his glory. Now, since we spend 40% of our lives at work, as much as 150,000 hours in an average lifetime, it's crucial that we find the right job and do what God has called us to do. Sometimes the temptation is to base this solely on financial matters. And though it is important, it's not all there is to it. 
There's more to it than that. Does this job give you a chance to do good? Does this job give you a sense of fulfillment? And the fourth question you need to ask yourself about your job is this. Is God a part of my job? The whole point of the, the entire book of Ecclesiastes is to say that without God, everything that we do is meaningless. No matter how rich you are, no matter how much fun you're having, no matter how big your family is, no matter how smart you are and how much you know, no matter how important your job is and how far you've climbed up the ladder in your times of service there, it's only God that brings purpose and meaning to life. And it doesn't matter if you're a trash collector or a factory worker or a teacher or a minister or a, a mechanic or a brain surgeon. If you don't recognize God in the midst of your work, then there is no real purpose to what you do. Any good that you might be doing is only temporary. Verse 14 of our passage says, I know everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. So no matter what your job is, God can be a part of it if you choose to include him. Now, for some of us, it's a lot easier than others. My job by its nature includes God. Although it may be possible even for a pastor to go about his job and leave God out of it. I think I've seen some pastors do that. Some of you may really have to think hard about how to include God in your jobs. It doesn't just happen naturally that God fits into the picture, but it most certainly can be done. If you would just consider that Jesus is standing right alongside you as you're doing your daily work, then you are including him. You may not be able to pray audibly in your job or to share the gospel freely. You may not feel like you're able to apply scriptures directly to your daily work. But if you do your job the best that you can, and you do it honorably and faithfully, then you are including God in your work, and you are glorifying him. And that is something that will endure forever. And that is truly significant. If you are among the 70% who don't like their current job, then one of two things has to change. Either you have to change your job, or you change the way you do your job. God wants to give you a job that you can love. Loving your job may be a matter of asking yourself these questions and making a list of all that's good about your job and, and changing your attitude about your work. Or it may be a matter of changing career direction entirely. It's a decision that you don't have to make alone because God will lead and guide you every step along the way. And as you consider these things, here is a final reminder. Whether you love your job or whether you're in that process of learning to love your job, it is crucial to remember that we don't work for ourselves. We don't work for a company. We don't work for an organization. We work for God, and we should do our jobs for him. I close by using the verse that Terry used for the kids about their jobs going to school in Colossians 3.23. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So as we observe Labor Day, let us thank God for the jobs that we have and the income that he has provided for us. And let us strive to do our work for the glory of God and with the excellence that would bring honor to the name of Christ. We're going to share together in the Lord's table in a little bit. But before we do that, we're going to sing a, a hymn of invitation and ask if there's anyone who would like to just include God in your life to begin with right now by asking him to save you from your sins through what Jesus did for you on the cross. And as we, we sing a song about the blessing that God can, can use us to, to be to others, if you would like to, to accept Christ as your Savior, would you come forward as we sing? And after that, then we'll, we'll have the Lord's Supper together. So let's stand together as we sing.
Please be seated. As is our custom on the first Sunday of the month, we will share together in the observance of the Lord's Supper, that commemoration of what Jesus did with his disciples the night before that he was crucified. And he reminded them of, of what symbols were included in the dinner that they shared. As they shared bread, he broke it and he said, this is my body. And he wanted them to remember for years to come that whenever they ate this bread, that they would be reminded of the sacrifice that he made, that his body would be broken like that bread was, and he would die on the cross. And he also took a cup and he said, this is my blood. And reminding that the cup that was poured out for them was, was a reminder of, of what Jesus would do that next day. And he would shed his blood, blood that was necessary to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. And so our usual custom before COVID was we would uh, have our deacons of the church pass out the, the elements and that gives you a chance to just to reflect on your life and, and, and to pray. And so I want you to take out your, your wafer and I have Susan play a song to give you that time just to, to reflect on what Jesus did for you and to commit your life to him. So let's do that as she plays. <laughs> Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. I ask you to take your cup and open it up. And again, as you pray, be sure to confess your sins, knowing that what this juice in here symbolizes is the blood of Jesus that was necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. So maybe just look at it as you pray, remembering what Jesus did for you and how you can be cleansed by the power of his blood. Jesus said, this cup which has been poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Drink all of it. I so look forward to that day that we can once again join hands across the sanctuary as we sing. But until then, we'll just stand where we are. Lift your hands to the Lord if you'd like on the second verse. And remember then to be dismissed row by row as we leave.
thank you for the beauty of it. We thank you for the beauty of our fellowship. Thank you for the gift of our employment and how you provide for our needs. And pray that we be able to take all these things that you've given to us and to proclaim your glory and to live and to work and to do and to be all for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.